A few weeks ago, I took a look at some Sega Genesis games that pushed the graphical limit of what the 16-bit hardware could do, and we looked at some incredible titles for the console. But several of you were quick to point out that I didn't include any of the games developed by the team known simply as Treasure. So this week, we're just going to focus entirely on games developed by Treasure and released on the Sega Genesis console. For those of you that have never heard of Treasure, it was a group of about 18 programmers based out of Tokyo that used to work for Konami. They left Konami and started their own company so that they could have more creative freedom in the types of games that they wanted to produce. One such game that they wanted to make was Gunstar Heroes, which was released in 1993. They specifically wanted to make this game for the Sega Genesis because they knew the processor would be able to handle some of the complex things they were wanting to do, as well as just the sheer load of things that would be going on at once. The story here is that you play as the Gunstars, who are trying to stop an evil empire from taking control of four very powerful gems. The main bad guy looks like M. Bison, and at one point he throws one of his henchmen at you. You can play single player or team up with a buddy, and it's similar to Mega Man in that you can pick which stage you want to start on. Also, this game is a bit more forgiving in that it's not one hit and you're dead like Contra. It operates on a point system. This game plays amazingly smooth, with all of the enemies flying around on screen and stuff blowing up at once. It's a technical sight to behold, and it's also just really fun to play. If you've played games like Contra 3 or Metal Slug, you get the idea here, although there's a twist to the weapon system. There are four different main weapons to choose from, but you can combine two of the four weapons to make, well, more powerful weapons. For example, if you have the force weapon, it fires a stream of bullets, but if you combine that with the chaser, you can fire a barrage of target sinking bullets. I found myself sticking with the target sinking flamethrower, especially for those hard to reach bosses, and you're gonna need all the help you can get. The stages are pretty lengthy and often combine multiple bosses. The Seven Force boss is particularly noteworthy for taking on an absurd amount of forms. This is all the same boss. Also, I mean, just look at it. Having this many moving limbs and all of the details simply wouldn't have worked on the Super Nintendo. Each of the levels is a little different, and once you beat all four of the main stages and collect all four of the gems, you go on to a final series of stages set in outer space, and the final boss fights are a relentless gauntlet. The bosses are all watching you fight it out one by one on Twitch, and then after you beat one boss, the next one joins into the fray. But also, this is just awesome to look at. Seriously, I can't stress enough how well this game is made, and it really looks like something you'd play on a Neo Geo arcade cabinet. It also boasts an excellent soundtrack to perfectly complement some of the beautiful artwork and detailed backgrounds. This is one that I definitely wish I would have played growing up, and although it tends to go on the pricier side, usually 40 or more dollars is a loose cartridge, it's definitely worth it if you love run and gun games like this. What are some of your favorite weapon combinations to use on this one? Next up, Dynamite Hetty was released in 1994. This time, you play as Hetty, a puppet that returns to his hometown of other toys and puppets, only to find that an evil dark demon puppet has unleashed hell on everything. Hetty escapes being incinerated by the dark demon's henchmen and sets off to take him down. If I could describe Dynamite Hetty in one word, it would be... quirky? And the offbeat but excellent soundtrack certainly complements that feeling. It's a platformer, but just different enough to be its own thing. So you play as Hetty, navigating through these lengthy, non-linear levels, and the premise here is that you can use your head as a weapon. No, literally, Hetty can just rip his head off and chuck it at the bad guys. Furthermore, you can use it as sort of a hook to move certain platforms around and reach new areas. And if that doesn't grab you, you can also swap out your head for other heads, each with their own special power. There's 18 wacky heads to choose from, such as Vacuum Head, which turns you into a vacuum and lets you sweep up all the bad guys, or Empty Head, which makes you invisible and the spike head lets you turn your head into a grappling hook for ambling up to those hard to reach places. And you also come across little mini games along the way, sometimes designed to act as tutorials to show you what all Dynamite Hetty can do, and other times they're just for fun. On top of the unique gameplay, Dynamite Hetty also boasts a colorful graphics palette with beautiful areas to explore and incredible oversized characters to interact with. Everything looks top notch, and this really shows off what the Sega Genesis could do like just knocking this giant object over and rolling it down a hill. That doesn't look like something you should be able to do in a 16-bit game, yet there it is. There's also crazy boss battles, and everything runs as smooth as you could want, even with all the oversized sprites moving around on screen. Dynamite Hetty is challenging, but not in that overly frustrating way, just enough to keep you wanting to come back to try to get to the next level. Definitely check this one out if you get the chance. Sí, 
Next up, a fighting game. Okay, I know I'm gonna mess this up, so bear with me. Yu Yu Hakusho Akiyu Koitsusun. All right, look, I tried, okay? This was based on the Yu Yu Hakusho manga series written and illustrated by Yoshihiro Togashi. All right, I'll level with you here. I'm not really much into fighting games anymore, and I don't really know much about manga, any manga, let alone this particular series. As far as I can tell, the story centers around Yasuki Yuramishi, a 14-year-old delinquent high school student who gets killed in a car accident while saving a small child's life and subsequently gets challenged by rulers of the afterlife to solve cases involving humans and demons. And then there was a lot of fighting in martial arts, so here's a fighting game. As far as 16-bit fighting games go, this one seems to have been pretty highly regarded in its time with tons of praise and positive reviews. The muddied art style of some of the backgrounds doesn't really blow me away, but there's a vast cadre of zany characters and the crazy over-the-top attacks seem like they'd be fun if you took the time to learn the moves. Also, there's lots of digitized voices for taunts, and even though I can't understand them, they're still pretty cool. This game also featured some additional modes you didn't always see in fighting games from that era. You could set up a tournament bracket with several fighters, kind of like March Madness, and have them duke it out. Plus, if you had the Sega Multitap, you could have up to four players fighting it out at the same time. This game was only released in Japan in 1994, but did see a release in Brazil by Tech Toy in 1999. Okay, up to this point we've taken a look at Treasures games on the Sega Genesis in chronological order, but actually I skipped one. Technically the very first game that Treasure developed for the Genesis was a game you wouldn't be expecting. McDonald's Treasureland Adventure. That's right kids, the same company that brought you Gunstar Heroes also made a licensed game based on the McDonald's fast food franchise and featuring familiar McDonald's characters such as Ronald McDonald, The Hamburglar, and Grimace. So, although technically the folks at Treasure had the idea for Gunstar Heroes all the way back when they worked for Konami, when they started Treasure and struck a deal with Sega, part of their contract obligated them to create a licensed McDonald's game. Treasure's response? Fine, we'll make the best damn McDonald's video game ever. This game was actually finished before Gunstar Heroes, although Sega liked Gunstar Heroes so much they ended up releasing that first, and Treasure Land Adventure was released a little later in 1993. So officially, this is Treasure's second game on the Sega Genesis. You play as Ronald McDonald and have to work your way through four worlds trying to find pieces of a treasure map. You can shoot and throw your scarf to pull yourself up onto ledges with these conveniently placed handles. I gotta be honest here. Some of the music is kind of nice and the graphics are actually well done in some spots, but otherwise, this game isn't all that much fun to play. You can only fire in one direction, your offensive weapon is painfully weak, and they like to put enemies directly above these handles I mentioned earlier, meaning as soon as you leap up, you take damage. That's… that's just great. This game tends to be on the pricier side, but unless you're just a rabid treasure fan and want to own all of their games, you have my permission to skip this one. It's not awful, but it's just not their best work, and you could do a lot better for that price. If you liked Gunstar Heroes but wished the game consisted only of boss battles, well, here you go. Alien Soldier was the next game released by Treasure, although this time the game only saw a physical release in Japan and European territories. The US only had access to this game via the Sega channel when it was first released in 1995. Thankfully, there were other official ways to play the game as it was eventually released on PS2 as part of the Sega Aegis 2500 set, and you can get it today on Steam for a dollar. Come on, you were just gonna spend that dollar at the vending machine anyway. Why not torture yourself with this brutally difficult game? I mentioned before it's basically all boss battles, and I wasn't kidding. Each stage is a short jaunt where you have to fight through some crazy eyeballs or other oversized bizarre looking aliens, and then boom, you get an insanely difficult boss battle. See that energy bar? That's the boss's energy. See this other one? That's you. This game features an incredible display of graphics with the oversized bosses and highly detailed backgrounds, and it also features a fantastic soundtrack, but holy crap is it hard. 
There's a story here about a bunch of aliens fighting each other and the main guy kind of looks like Star Fox, I don't know. The control scheme is pretty deep too. It's much more than just a run and gun shooter. You've got a multifaceted attack system where you can queue up several different weapons, similar to Gunstar, and you can change them out on the fly. The game has a nice built-in feature where you can try all of these out first to see which ones you like, and it also has a test area for getting used to the controls and this is very helpful. You've got a dash move that does significant damage if you're at full health, and if you're not at full health, you can tap the B button to do a counter move that will yield health power-ups from enemy bullets. But you only get a small amount of health from doing this, and as soon as you get hit, you're just going to lose a ton of health anyway. Also, if you fiddle around too long, you'll just run out of time. Did I mention this game was hard? It only comes in two difficulties, super easy or super hard. Well, they're both super painful, so if you're up for the challenge, I dare you to track down Alien Soldier and give it a shot. Well, if your thumbs are sore from all of these run and gun shooters, Treasure has you covered because rounding out their assortment of Sega Genesis titles is something you're totally not expecting at this point. Light Crusader is a laid back isometric action RPG with a medieval setting, your usual castles and knights lore complete with cutscenes and everything. This was released in 1995 and unlike Alien Soldier, this actually did receive a physical release in the US. You play as Sir David. A knight who's just trying to enjoy his vacation only to find that several people in this town have mysteriously gone missing and the king has summoned you to investigate. This game is a little slow to get going. You'll spend some time just meandering around the castle talking to townsfolk and trying to find out more information. One thing I have to nitpick about right away is the way you interact with NPCs. For some reason you can just push NPCs around, even knock them off ledges. And the talk button is the same as the sword button so you're liable to just be pushing characters around the room haphazardly swinging your sword like an idiot trying to to talk to the townsfolk. They also decided to forego the traditional menu system for interacting with shop owners, and instead you just jump onto the table and touch whatever item you're interested in buying. This is unintuitive because you may have to do this just to see what the item is or how much it costs, and if you just start mashing buttons out of frustration, you may end up accidentally buying something you didn't actually want. Okay, none of that is necessarily a deal breaker, but I feel like Treasure should have maybe brought in an RPG consultant or something just to get some of these very basic RPG functions ironed out. Anyway, if I could sum up Light Crusader in one word, it would probably just be fine. It's a fine game. Nothing necessarily special that will blow you away, but the characters and areas all look really nice, and I also really dig the soundtrack. There's some shades of Castlevania in some of the dungeon themes. You get your basic loadout of medieval weapons and equipment, and you can also get some different magic attacks that you can even mix and match for different effects. Treasure is all about mixing and matching various weapons. Jumping around in an isometric setting is a little clumsy, but not bad. The hack and slash action is fun, although the hit detection leaves a bit to be desired. Thankfully, this game seems to be fairly liberal with dropping health power-ups, and it seems to lean more heavily on puzzle-solving elements instead of the non-stop action that you might see in Diablo or other similar titles. If you're a fan of this type of game, it's certainly worth checking out. I think this is pretty neat, and I could totally see myself playing all the way through this. I definitely wish I would have had a chance to play this growing up, but if you're not a fan of isometric RPGs, then this title certainly isn't going to do anything special to change your mind. Light Crusader typically goes on the cheaper end of the spectrum if you're looking to play on original hardware. It was also included with the recently released Sega Genesis Mini Console, or you can find it on Steam for a buck. Well, that's it for this week. What did you think of Treasure Games on the Sega Genesis? I'd love to hear which one was your favorite or what your experience with these games was like growing up. If you enjoyed this, you might want to check out some of the other videos I've done specific to the Sega Genesis in the past. What are some other Sega Genesis games or developers you'd like to see me feature in a future episode? As always, thank you for watching. Please don't text and drive, and I'll see you next time on Friday Night Arcade.